happening. We should uh, we should begin. Um, I was uh, carefully watching uh, the, the the clock there, and now it's uh, on the hour. So um, I wish you all welcome to uh, this side event uh, today. Uh, apparently, this lunchtime is actually a kind of a um, a lot of side events here. So we are we are really happy to see uh, the attendance. Uh, we are very grateful to that. And um, you have seen the uh, the flyer already. Um, this event is labeled Sustainable Lunar Environment Challenges and Opportunities. And um, I would like to first say, why am I doing, what am I doing here? Uh, why am I always uh, <laughs> turning up? No, it's because uh, Giuseppe Ribaldi had, had a slight accident, so he couldn't travel to Vienna. But uh, Giuseppe, you are online, aren't you? I don't know if you can talk to us. Yes, I'm online. Yes, say something nice about you. You are recovering well, no? Yes, uh, I am recovering well, but I could not travel because of back pain. So thank you to all of you. And I'm going to listen part of the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you so much. And as you all know, we had promised some uh, luncheon, some catering, and it did arrive. So I've been told that it's outside of this room. So once we're done, we go there and we have a bite. Um, I I would like to just uh, uh, tell you that we will have this uh, this panel discussion um, with uh, four eminent speakers uh, representing their various organizations. And um, thereafter, we hope that we can have a dialogue, a discussion with the views and thoughts, and uh, then we go for a bite. So <laughs> having said that, I, I would like to, um, to introduce uh, the panelists. Um, we have first to my right, Ian Crawford, uh, who is representing the Moon Village Association in, in this panel, and particularly the Gegsla Initiative, where he's the chair of Working Group One. Uh, so you will talk more about that, yes. And um, after Ian, we have Pascal Ehrenfreud uh, to my right, who is the president of COSPAR and my boss, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard Green, uh, representing the IAU, International Astronomical Union. And lastly, Michelle Handlon, the founder of For All Mankind. Oh, no. uh, why did I say mankind? Even that is wrong today. Yeah, Moonkind, right. yes. So um, I would therefore just like to, um, to, to get going. Ian, uh, you are first out, please. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. So, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Ian Crawford. I'm a planetary scientist uh, based at the University of London in the UK. Uh, but as Nicholas said, I'm here today to represent the Moon Village Association, which is one of the sponsors of this event. So I thought I should introduce the Moon Village Association. You can see these on the screen in front of you. But the, the Moon Village Association was created in 2017 to support what was then the Moon Village Initiative of the then ESA Director General, uh, whose idea, vision, was to forge an international collaboration for the exploration of the Moon. So the Moon Village Association exists to advance the development of, of all of activities on the Moon involving industry, government, and space agencies, non-GOs, and the wider public. And as you can see on the screen, we've now got over 800 individual members uh, and 30 institutional members from well over uh, 80 countries. Now, the Moon Village Association has many, uh, many activities. It's got many working groups in the field of lunar architecture and cultural activities and uh, was instrumental in getting the UN to approve the International Moon Day initiative. But I, I'm really here to stress, if I find the next slide, one of our activities. Ooh, so they did advance earlier. <laughs> if I could have the next slide. Oh, thank you. Yep. So in 2021, the Moon Village Association established the um, the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, the Gegsler Initiative, um, which is designed to bring uh, international experts together to try and um, identify how we might uh, coordinate on the international uh, e exploration of the moon, and especially with a view to preserving its natural environment for scientific and cultural reasons. Um, Gegsler produced this framework document. You can find it on the Gegsler um, website, which is a sub, sub directory from the Moon Village Association website called the Framework for Coordination, uh, where many of our, our proposals are set out. I might need to ask someone to advance. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, sorry, there's a slight time delay. <laughs> uh, uh, just draw your attention to these QR codes, the Gegsler um, uh, 2023 annual report on the left and the, um, the Moon Village Association annual report on the left and the Gegsler report on the right. Uh, there are a couple of hard copies on the table at the back um, right of the room and some more copies of the QR code if you would like to scan them. Um, so, uh, as Nicholas indicated, Gegsler has set up three uh, working groups. Uh, one working group to uh, deal with lunar uh, the lunar environment, which is our topic main topic today. There's another working group to cover lunar uh, uh, technical coordination and a. Um, a third working group on multi-stakeholder activities. Um, now, I co-chair working group one with John Claude Worms from uh, COSPAR on, on the lunar environment uh, aspect. So I just wanted to give an impression um, of the kind of things we're talking about in this working group. Um, this photograph is a very beautiful photograph. It was to the south pole of the moon. It was taken by Japan's Kaguya spacecraft in 2007. Um, and I don't know whether my laser pointer can reach. Oh, there we go. So the spacecraft is flying over the south pole of the moon here. Um, and so the moon, the south pole of the moon, because the south pole of the moon looks the right way up, the Earth looks upside down. So th this is the continent of Australia there, just where the laser pointer is, and Southeast Asia is down here. Um, anyway, I show this slide because it shows there is a lot of shadow. And there's a lot of shadow at the moon's poles because the sun is always on the horizon at the lunar poles. And this is what makes the lunar poles a very special place because the interiors of deep craters, this is a 20 kilometer diameter impact crater called Shackleton. And the geographical south pole of the moon is just there where the laser pointer is. Craters at the south pole, at both poles of the moon, never see the sun because the sun is always on the horizon. So the floors of these craters are very cold, something like minus 240 degrees Celsius. And water ice is stable under a vacuum at those low temperatures. So this water ice that we believe to be preserved in these permanently shadowed craters are of extreme scientific importance. They're, they're of scientific importance for multiple reasons. 
Uh, one reason is the interiors of these dark, cold craters would be excellent sites for some types of astronomical observations, especially infrared astronomy and perhaps gravitational wave astronomy. And Richard will talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, from an astrobiology point of view, which astrobiology is the science of searching for life in the universe, we, we believe these the ices in these permanent shadowed craters will contain a record of the delivery of water, and also organic materials to the Earth-Moon system over time. And they're preserved on the Moon, but there'll also be a record of the solar system's delivery of ice and organics to the Earth, which you see in the background. Um, so we believe by studying ices in these permanently shadowed craters, we will gain in important insights into the history of, of organic materials and volatiles in the inner solar system, um, as well as them being excellent sites for um, uh, for some aspects of astronomy. But then there is a tension here because there is also a great economic interest in the ices in these permanently shadowed craters, because if the ice can be mined, it can be turned into water. Um, oh, it is water. It can be turned into hydrogen and oxygen, which would be very useful materials on, on the moon uh, and in cislunar space. So there is a tension. Um, we, it would be a shame if we had people mining ices in the same craters where scientists were trying to understand the early history of the solar system and, and where astronomers had built a, 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 an expensive infrared telescope. So there has to be some coordination. It would be desirable if there was some coordination for these activities. This is my last slide. Uh, the red dots show the permanently shadowed regions around the north pole of the moon on the left the south pole of the moon on the right. So you can see the red dots are where the permanent shadows are. They're, they're of interest to science, multiple sciences, and also to commercial activities. So there are some dozens of them, but there aren't an infinite number of them. So it would be highly valuable if we could reach an international framework that could coordinate activities and, and decide who could use which of these very precious locations for which purposes. So these are the th kind of things we're talking about in the Gexler working group. Um, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Ian. And um, actually, you you really put um, uh, the, the, the question out there, you know, how to how to balance those various interests and avoid a conflict of interest, uh, because we have I mean, political interest, obviously policy interests, scientific interests, and commercial interests, and particularly for the PSRs, the South Pole, where everyone seems to be going, um, there could be, um, you know, problems in this regard. So we need to find a balance in that regard, and also maybe, in the longer run, to create synergies between the communities, so that you do scientific research for prospecting for research utilization. And that data could also then be shared with the astrobiological community, vice versa. And that could be a way. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think I agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, uh, uh, anyone who has an urgent question of technical nature to Ian, we can take that right now. Yes. Please. Uh, can you tell us anything about lava tubes? Yes, so 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 I've highlighted here the poles, the permanently shadowed regions on the north, the north and south poles of the moon, as places of scientific interest. They're not the only places. So thank you, Chris, for raising this. They're not the only places uh, on the moon of scientific interest. So lava tubes are natural caves. They occur in not at the poles, but they occur in the lunar mare, the so-called lunar seas, which are volcanic plains. And they're, yes, they're underground natural caverns. These two are, will be of great scientific, uh, no, we haven't explored any yet, uh, and they too are probably of great scientific interest. And so the, the same argument applies. It would be good to ha have an international coordination mechanism that could help uh, coordinate activities at lava tubes as well. And as, as, and as Richard will say in a minute, I'm sure the whole lunar far side is of great interest to the radio astronomers because it's a radio quiet zone. So actually there are multiple places on the moon that would uh, benefit fit from this kind of coordination activity. But th th thank you for mentioning the lava tubes. Okay, thank you, Chris, for that question. Uh, Torsten, we will keep your question and we will get back to that in the discussion, okay? Yeah, because we have to move on. Just to say, we all know you, Chris. 
uh, from Moon, and I, <laughs> I'm doing the same now. I almost said mankind um, from a Secure World Foundation. But it's good when you take the floor if you if you say who you are. Okay, so we move on now. Pascal, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank uh, thank you very much, and then good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm trying to present uh, 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 very, very briefly COSPA, and I'm also really here to emphasize how important it is to look at scientific results and the wealth of scientific results which we have, and actually the new incoming findings, how important uh, this is actually to put that into uh, policy perspective. So um, I just want to introduce COSPAR. Um, uh, uh, COSPAR is um, uh, 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 the Committee on Space Research. It was uh, founded in 1958, and uh, it is uh, more or less composed by members of the national scientific institutions worldwide, and by um, uh, has members of many international scientific unions and more than 13,000 associates. So this is our strength. We cover the entire domain of uh, the space sector. Uh, and I show you this, I know it's a little bit much, but I have uh, made uh, something in blue, which is in particular important for the topic and also in order, for instance, to support uh, ATLAC in the future if it goes ahead. And these are, for instance, our commissions. We have eight scientific commissions which cover everything, including also astronomy. That's why we are also very closely linked uh, to uh, the other organizations here uh, on the table but also life science related to space, um, fundamental physics. So we really cover everything. And then we have particular panels and they are more flexible because we can actually create them ad hoc, like for instance, the panel on potentially detrimental activities in space. So unfortunately we have a, um, a simultaneous site event now on SSA, but uh, for instance, this panel, PIDAS, is actually looking at uh, the debris regime in the cislunar orbit. And radiation belt environmental modeling, that's something which is really important for everybody uh, also going into the in, into deep space. Uh, space weather, uh, which is very strong, uh, linked to the UN, uh, our panel on space liner, and the panel on planetary protection, I want to, to mention. Um, the COSPA panel there, uh, uh, on planetary protection for, is, for over six decades has been instrumental in upholding the principles uh, of the Outer Space Treaty advising on preventing biological contamination. So there is a COSPA planetary protection policy and uh, actually the co-chair of the panel is um, um, Niklas and he can answer you all the questions because that's a very typical example how we actually work together with the UN, with experts and with uh, um, uh, everybody in order to uh, uh, to involve a multi-stakeholder uh, decision uh, uh, process and also really have uh, regulations out there which are adhered to uh, by uh, all the space agencies right now. And so we have many panels, I will not go into the details, but uh, I want to really to stress our long-term relation to the United Nations. COSPA was the first organization which got granted observer status uh, to UN COPOS, and that was in 1962. And uh, so we have a memorandum of understanding. We work on many different things together, as I just mentioned, the COSPA panel on planetary protection, but also satellite dynamics, space debris, and in particular concerning uh, um, uh, the moon, uh, the whole Commission B, and many of the panels, and also the panel on space exploration, which looks at environmental sustainability on the moon, is really um, um, ready in order to deliver data and uh, in order, you know, to strengthen all the initiatives. And uh, we are really, really happy to uh, uh, to do that. And I just wanted to mention that we are meeting in two weeks uh, in to for our scientific assembly in Busan in South Korea. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, I want just to close that um, here you have also the 
uh, all all our links that uh, COSPAR is this really large uh, space um, science and technology body which can with its 13,000 associates and, and scientists and engineers is, is ready to help uh, you know for instance with environmental databases with uh, cis lunar debris with all kind of, of, of issues which come up in this process and wants really to um, support uh, the uh, ATLAC when it is coming uh, to be, uh, uh, and and uh, I can answer questions after. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Pascal. And also, I uh, Cusper also have quite active panels, two panels, one on education and one on capacity building, uh, particularly for building up space infrastructure in developing countries. And I think they are also underpinning the work of of the other panels in 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 their substantive outputs. So it, that that's also making yes. course quite dynamic, isn't it? So yes, actually we uh, we have a lot of education activities, and also when we have our scientific assemblies and symposia. Uh, uh, also with the regional uh, environment and uh, we have capacity building workshops they go over all topics and uh, actually this year we are in Thailand, China, Uzbekistan and Kenya uh, so about four workshops uh, all over and please uh, contact us if you are if you are interested thank okay. you so one question I don't know Torsten if your question remains now but will be posed to Pascal <laughs> no. So you will have to wait on. Uh, anyone else? Uh, one question before we, before we move on? Okay, so we move on. Richard Green, please, IAU Astronomy and the concerns that you were seeing. And thank you. So the IAU is really the International Professional Society for Astronomers. It was established quite a while ago, 1919. Um, my role, one of my roles at the moment is chairing a working group on astronomy on the moon because we have recently recognized that there needs to be this kind of discussion in order to protect the option of scientific investigation of astronomy on the moon. So what are we? It's got a mission, which is to promote the science of astronomy, not surprisingly. Founded in 1919, we've now got close to 13,000 members, 92 countries. And a main job is sponsoring scientific meetings. But in addition, this is the gatekeeper for fundamental constants, for unambiguous nomenclature, for assigning designations to celestial bodies and features, and the UN recognized this in 1982. So our particular activity about uh, concerns about the moon is at the moment um, subsumed under the, the standing commission on protection of astronomical sites. That's both present and future ones. So this is future look for sure. Okay, there we go. So, as you've heard, there are at least three classes of observations that are of interest and makes the moon the unique place in the inner solar system, bar none, for doing these kinds of observations. So by international convention through the ITU, the far side of the moon is so well shielded from radio transmissions from Earth and other places, that it has been designated as a sort of radio quiet zone. The particular interest is for ultra low frequency radiations, which is very difficult to detect noise free on the Earth. And it is a probe of the cosmology of the early universe, because the primary transition of hydrogen in the radio is redshifted into these megahertz type frequencies. Um, and so there is structure in that. There are absorbing shadows from these primordial clouds of hydrogen that are detectable and create structure. In addition, with a big enough array, um, we can see magnetospheric activity in exoplanets, which tells you whether they're self-shielding enough to support life. So it's interested and interesting. And they're subject not to 
broadcast transmissions out of band, but about unshielded noisy electronics. So the challenge is coordination in a way that the lunar rover that's driving by isn't jamming the signal of these very sensitive radio telescopes. There's also interest in sensitive detection in communications bands. Um, um, for instance, the ultimate SETI sensitivity search for extraterrestrial intelligence could be a large dish in a crater in the moon. As you heard, the possibility of having a cooled infrared telescope in one of these permanently shadowed regions enables all kinds of interesting science where we can be back I'm jumping around the third bullet in there, um, small distortions in the spectral energy of the diffuse cosmic microwave background shows you growth and um, aberrations from the birth of structure in the very early universe. But more to the point, um, most of the information in planetary atmospheres is in this thermal infrared. And so the possible, and the fact that you're at the pole means that you can watch the sky go by essentially all the time and track e external planets around other stars um, through their day-night cycles. And, and if we find an Earth 2.0, this would be the place to actually characterize um, sort of um, lifelike contributions to the contribution to the composition of its atmosphere. Gravitational waves is another place. Um, branch of astronomical science that is uniquely done from the moon because the moon is so much seismically quieter than the earth. So that means you can do lower frequencies and detect mergers of different size black holes of white dwarfs throughout the galaxy of um, inspiraling black holes a lot earlier than you can do from the earth because of these low frequencies. Uh, there are two ways to do that. One is an array of cryogenically cooled seismometers in the floor of one of these craters. Another is a sort of LIGO, Virgo, cagra like arrangement with lasers a across a crater, for example. But both of those require real isolation from the noise and, and um, rumbling of mines and of vehicles. And so um, they require enough isolation to have the sensitivity they need. So a policy statement, there are lots of legitimate activities that will go on on the moon. And we need a framework whereby some of the places that need the isolation to achieve these exquisitely sensitive measurements can be preserved for that purpose. You. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, and basically, you are touching on the same concerns as as, as Ian did. You know, um, the need from the scientific community to to preserve and protect scientific investigation and research, and in your case, astronomical research. And and there, you know, how to strike that balance between you know what are the interests, the competing interests. And uh, of course, we will have to see how to achieve that. But uh, that that must be really a big a big issue, you know. Yeah. One question to Richard. Yes. Just to add to what Nicholas told. See now, uh, uh, it's very exciting the way uh, Mr. Green has told regarding the possibilities of astronomy. At the same time, already. According to me, the moon is slowly getting cluttered. And in very soon, maybe in a couple of years or more than the, or within that, I think the cluttering is going to further increase. So the discussion of dark and quiet skies becomes relevant in moon also now. So why don't we, as Nicholas also indicated, the parallel discussions on how to survive with, with both interest needs to be seriously discussed. Otherwise, again, we'll land in some problem after five years or 10 years, where we'll be again discussing on dark and quiet skies of the moon. We think you're exactly right, that the time is now to start talking about um, 
how to preserve these special sites for for investigation and how to preserve the environment more generally so that you know um people are protected against the lofting of regolith from you know from from takeoffs and landings that the we get some specificity about which sites in the shielded zone need to be protected but then that starts very soon so uh you know this is the time to, to lay out the long-term future to enable those investigations so. thank you very much so we move on michelle uh, for all moonkind uh, please you have the floor she's working on that. okay well i just want to say um Thank you for having me. Thanks for showing up. To I'm I am completely different from all these great brains over here. I'm I'm just a lawyer, um, so I teach space law at the University of Mississippi. But I'm here in my capacity as the co-founder of For All Moonkind. Uh, we're the only organization in the world that's focused on protecting cultural heritage uh, beyond Earth in outer space. And so um, this is clearly something we don't want to see happening uh, on the moon at all, perhaps, but definitely not right next to the Apollo 11 lunar, la lunar landing site. Um, so we are a nonprofit NGO or permanent observers here, and I'm um, very honored to be uh, permanent observers, um, very new ones. We got ours in 2018. Um, our team is entirely volunteer. Uh, uh, unfortunately, not one of us earns a penny from For All Moonkind. Um, one of my wonderful volunteers is with us today. Gregory financed his own trip here, does, it, does all of this work for us um, on his own dime. Um, and so we're, we're really grateful, but that really shows the passion that people have um, at our organi organization for protecting cultural heritage. Um, and again, you know, it's it's a lot more than just thinking about, oh, you know, we don't want to see these things go away. It's a lot about becoming part of the framework. Um, and we believe at From Moonkind, heritage is actually the starting point for that framework, because one of the, the first things we have to do as we as we uh, build this concept is agree on what sites should be protected and what sites should uh, should be saved or what sites need to be safeguarded for science or for history. Um, and we can all agree on cultural heritage because we do all agree uh, on earth about cultural heritage. And so I put this slide in because I want, you know, people sort of think, oh, it's the moon, it's far away. That stuff's been up there for 50 years. You know, the Chinese stuff is much, much newer, but um, it's all protected. There's there's no erosion on the moon. There's no uh, there's no weather. So all of that stuff is still there. You can see the astronauts' footprints. And so when we we talk about protecting the bootprints, we're really talking about you know they really are there. The only thing that is um, interrupting them right now are you know the the small meteorites. And as far as we can tell, nothing's been damaged by those yet. Um, but as has been noted, we are going back to the moon in droves. Um, we're going the hundreds of missions are planned within the next decade. Um, and sadly, you know, one of the things we learned um, in this past decade is that uh, lunar uh, artifacts can uh, fetch a lot of money. So in uh, 2019, 2018, um, uh, NASA had lost control of the very first bag of collecting a moon sample um, carried by Neil Armstrong. It ended up in private hands, and she, this woman, sold that bag for two point seven million dollars. Um, and then she sued NASA because she said she should have gotten four million dollars, and NASA had kept some of the regolith. And sure enough, NASA had kept uh, three or four, you know, microscopic pieces of the regolith, um, and they had to pay her eight hundred thousand dollars for that. So these. Um, artifacts um, uh, will be uh, can be trafficked, unfortunately. Um, we have had some success um, in the United States. We drafted and helped to pass the One Small Step to Protect Human Heritage and Space Act. It's the first national legislation ever to recognize cultural heritage in outer space. Um, it doesn't go nearly as far as we want it to go, but it does say that uh, if you are contracting with NASA, you have to pay special attention to at least the American heritage sites. And of course, we have Section 9 in the Artemis Accords, which is the first multilateral agreement now signed by 43 countries um, that recognizes um, the existence of human heritage in outer space, and we're very eager to see um, and help um, to see how that gets implemented. Um, we would also love to see a resolution adopted by the General Assembly. Again, um, 
it's not difficult to agree about heritage. We do that here on Earth. The UNESCO World Heritage Convention um, is is uh, ratified by every nation on Earth. And it's not just Americans that have artifacts up there. Luna 2 was the first object ever to impact another celestial body, the Soviet Union. Apollo 11, first humans. Chang'e 4, first rover on the far side. And Chandrayaan 3, first, uh, first human uh, made object to impact the lunar south pole. These are all things that uh, capture the universality. And when I say universality, what I mean is um, we th we look at these as national achievements, but they are really human achievements. And they're human achievements built on a millenni millennia of history. We don't get to the moon unless our common ancestor stands up on two feet to free up our hands, right? We don't get to the moon without somebody in the Congo figuring out math. We don't get to the moon without math. We don't get to the moon without Copernicus. We don't get to the moon without glass. Uh, first developed in Mesopotamia. So these are achievements that are really the capstone so far of our human evolution. And one of these footprints is protected. That's the footprint in Laitoli, Tanzania, which indicates the first time we think that uh, humans ever stood up on two feet. Um, that's the, of course, Buzz Aldrin's boot print. Um, and one is protected and the other isn't. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have, and you don't have to apologize for being a lawyer. I'm a lawyer myself. <laughs> so I, I do in some circles. So <laughs> yeah. But it 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 comes to my mind. I mean, what, what we are doing here is is really interdisciplinary and uh, combining, you know, science, technology, law, and policy uh, into one mix. And that is also why, and Ian mentioned it uh, initially. Uh, the 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 initiative of Gegsla is really to put you know all those uh, resources uh, together and skills and knowledge you know, uh, so uh, I I think all those organizations uh, how disparate they might be, are really come together because we have the same interest. You added cultural sites, heritage sites. We talked about scientific protection sites, astronomical sites, mm -hmm. but now we add also the perspective of social science and humanities into the whole mix. So I think that is that is quite, quite powerful. Thank you, I think, and yeah, people don't realize there are more than a hundred sites on the moon. There are probably about 115 now that have evidence of human activity on them. Um, mm -hmm. And so really talking about a lot of stuff. And again, not all of it needs to be protected and preserved. Um, we need to figure out how we're gonna identify yeah. uh, which ones do need that protection, just as we do with the scientific sites. Yeah, absolutely. So one question to Michelle. All right. So I intend I intend now to uh, open the floor for a, a um, engaging discussion and dialogue. Uh, I know Torsten is waiting eagerly to to be given the floor. Uh, and as I said, and I want to stress that that uh, this is really why we are here to present those organizations and uh, what we are doing because. Um, and I see the uh, the, the Romanian uh, delegate, the former chair of the committee, uh, Dorin Pronario, uh, who is driving uh, the building up or evolution of, of this action team. And uh, we hope that that we, um, gathering knowledge and, and uh, that type of expertise, uh, could, could have a role and, and give, you know, inputs, scientific, technical, and legal inputs to, to that work. Um, so uh, I open the floor now, and uh, I know Torsten, I will actually ask you to, to uh, <laughs> ask your question now because you have been waiting. Yeah, been in the holding pattern for a moment. Um, <laughs> I'm Torsten, Torsten Grinning from Spacewatch Global, and my question uh, is directed to Ian, but everyone else uh, is uh, invited to uh, join in uh, into the um, answer as well. You mentioned that the commercial interest on the moon is is rising with with all the missions we we, we mentioned that and ice is very high on the um, interest of the commercial entities as well because there's obviously money to make. So you requested that it has to be balanced, um, but you didn't went further. So who should do that? Um, that's an easy question, I know. Uh, and who would be the right entity, in your opinion, to? make this licensing what it is then at the end so thank you i mean this is really the crux of the matter isn't it but i i'm not sure that it's my role as a scientist to prescribe what the entity should be i think from a scientific point of view it's clear there needs to be some international framework for designating sites of special scientific importance 
Um, it clearly has to be international or there's no point. It's got to be to some degree enforceable because otherwise some of these special sites may be damaged before they can be studied. So, I mean, I think the, the APLAC proposal is, is, is clearly on the right lines. We need to initiate discussions at the UN level on what would be an appropriate framework. So I think all I can say from the scientific side is we desperately need such a framework um, and then <laughs> and make that plea to the politicians and the space lawyers in the in the room. Yes, Pascal. Yeah, I, I still would, would like to add that it is um, quite important to align the stakeholders and that we are all may or less have a basic uh, knowledge uh, what is happening in these kind of areas. So uh, I think this is also a, a step forward uh, for, for ATLAC in the future in order to involve um, the commercial actors, which of course are getting more and more. I think we have about 30 missions uh, to the moon planned, you know, until 2030. Um, and um, I think a good example is, for instance, the Planetary Protection Panel, um, which works together with the United Nations and has uh, industry participants, you could probably say one, one, one sentence, where we invite everybody on a table and discuss. And one, one thing which I, um, because we had very short presentations, uh, could not bring over. I think it is really, really important that um, when we um, frame policies and um, and, and regulations is that uh, we have a really establish a robust mechanism for ensuring that the most recent scientific discoveries and also advancements in space research are incorporated and that there is a mechanism that um, organizations can rely on these informations and on some kind of a transfer mechanism, databases, and so on. I think all the science organizations, as I certainly speak for the organizations here on, on the table, would be happy you know, to help with that, because I think it is really um, important that regulations are based on the best av av available evidence uh, and can also adapt because we are getting scientific discoveries all the time, can also adapt to, uh, to new challenges and opportunities. Sure. And you've implicitly heard that there are three kinds of um, timescales that we're concerned about for this preservation. I would argue that for pristine ices, there needs to be selection, there needs to be sampling to make sure that adequate samples are, are projected, they need an analysis time, but in the end, Perhaps that resource could then be exploited for other purposes once the science has been done. So that's a relatively short-term reserve. Astronomical missions in space tend to have a mission lifetime. It can be as short as cryogen exhaustion, or it could be a couple of decades, but it's not forever. And then there are Michelle's concerns where there are heritage sites, maybe even natural sites that do need eternal preservation, basically. And so this structure that needs to be set up can have multiple ways of interacting with the multiple stakeholders in order to decide on the usage and the term of usage. If I can just add also, I think the keys here are adaptive and flexible. And I think that's why the ATLAC is such a great opportunity because it's just gathering information, understanding what's out there. You're not making regulations yet, but um, we don't know. For for example, I would argue that our, our history is, is the most vulnerable resource we have on the moon right now because of the plume effect, right? We have no idea when something big lands on the moon, what that's going to do to some of the artifacts we have up there. Um, but the more we learn, the more we'll be able to say, oh, okay, we can get closer or, or we can now go to that area or now that we've gathered all this information, um, it makes sense to allow this to happen or to not allow that to happen. Any other question? Yep. Um, Bernie Glaude from the ITU. Um, I found this discussion interesting because in ITU, we consider um, uh, the orbital uh, location and the allocation and regulation from an orbital uh, of the frequency spectrum from an orbital location. 
So at some point, if the uh, has the uh, activities uh, on the moon is uh, growing, we will maybe see a, a kind of filing of uh, of spectrum on or around the moon, and at that moment we may see a, a kind of light licensing or filing from a location on the moon. So do you see any connection uh, possible? Uh, in between uh, filing or licensing from a loca uh, of spectrum from a location on the moon with uh, regulation of the surface of the moon. But we, we tend to see that it's similar to the Antarctica management. So is this discussion already ongoing? I defer to our spectrum management colleague here, yeah. but but there are two aspects or three aspects, I guess, right? One one is keeping clear of interference from things in orbit around the moon. A second is, um, do we need an analogy to ground-based telescope radio quiet zones where there are power limits um, allowable to come in to a, a site that has a sensitive radio telescope. And the biggest challenge is that rovers and explorers are going to need radio communications to do their jobs and they aren't fixed. So, um, you know, how to preserve a flux limit at a radio telescope site is an interesting ab initio challenge for the moon. Can can I defer to my colleague who's really expert Thank you. on this? Uh, Federico Di Bruno from Square Kilometer Array Observatory, an Earth-based observatory, ray <laughs> observatory. Uh, I, I think your your question, Veronique, uh, can be very easily explained with the situation we have on Earth right now with radio telescopes, where some of our radio, radio telescopes are located in radio quiet zones as ours in South Africa and Australia. And it's it's a very difficult discussion when you start having international discussions about radio quiet zones, right? Right now, a radio quiet zone is a national measure that the country puts in place. And it's a very good question if it's possible to put something similar on the moon and how you would do it. But definitely for some of the, the things that Richard was mentioning, like low frequency astronomy, radio astronomy, where unintentional emissions can be very challenging, that definitely can be one of the things to think about is how to define areas where the use of the radio spectrum needs to be protected for low frequency radio astronomy. Hmm. So I have been told that we have to be out of the room at two because we have to be led to the catering and then we can continue our discussion uh, during our luncheon. Uh, that is what the orders uh, I have been, been told. But <laughs> before we do that, I'm, I, I just wanted to connect because we have Mr. Uma Maheshwaran with us, uh, the current chair of the STSC working group on long-term sustainability. And uh, you know that you had a, a working group meeting actually right before uh, lunchtime. And uh, I, I know you are not dealing with, with, with the lunar environment or celestial bodies, of course, it's uh, Earth orbits. But uh, when we are now seeing this uh, increasing concentration of activities, uh, particularly on the moon, uh, we have a new dilemma that uh, transcends to dilemma we have in low Earth orbit, and that is the cislunar uh, region with uh, potential space debris, debris uh, proliferation. So uh, I, I, I want to just to connect that. And actually, there is an LTS guideline uh, that deals with preserving the environment in outer space and uh, the moon and other celestial bodies. So there is at the end of the document, there is a guideline that actually encourages states to take measures, appropriate measures, that is said, uh, um, to uh, to that effect. So, uh, Mr. Uma Mahesh Maran, I don't know if you want to say something very shortly on how is this going in the long-term sustainability working group? Thank you, Nicholas, for giving an opportunity. Of course, I think I don't need to dwell on what is going on in LTS now because I think all of you are quite where I, th I think things are going very positively. Uh, what what really um, amazes me or what really makes me very happy is the, 
the ten the i would say the the approach taken by each member state to come into a consensus i think that is really encouraging so that even though discussions will take time at least we are trying to converge and that is very positive so coming to the discussion today again we are uh, as madam was asking regarding uh, you know he was asking regarding a simple he said it's a very simple question but i think it's a very complicated question because <laughs> no because i am i am i am allow me um, maybe i am becoming quite philosophical the the entire problem lies with us we humans and i i always say that we are the worst species in the world compared to any other species living in this world so that if we are able to converge on what is our need and what is good for the society and what is good for human existence most of these issues can be resolved but unfortunately it is not so that is been evidenced by the series of earlier his prehistoric wars to the three world wars what we had to two world wars were and what is having now so he was asking about who is the right person to have an international body to regulate i think even if you find a reasonably satisfactory body to regulate i don't think it is going to be successful until and unless the whole humanity's approach changes so we are in a very tough and difficult situation wherein uh, I, maybe i am sounding very pessimistic but i am not seeing um, a satisfactory answer or a solution for this but these discussions definitely should go because at least these are the uh, points of a bright light where we can we can have some deterrence to this uh, that sh definitely should be encouraged and it should continue but i don't think we need, we will get a solution for this this is my personal opinion i'm sorry for taking this time thank you thank you ma uh, so dorin we are in your hands uh, we can provide you with information and data and support uh, your work we hope uh, that will evolve thank you we need it mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> thank you so having said that i now intend to close unfortunately we have to be out of this room but um, i don't know who is going to lead us to the catering uh, yes please so we go there and uh, we continue our discussion